Let me pray briefly again, then we're just going to go through this. I'm going to be reading Mark chapter 3. We're going to talk about just the first six verses that are there. Um, won't be long. I just want to share just a brief principle um, so we can move forth and be who God would have us to be. Lord, we thank you for you. We pray that as we go to your word, that you would bring to your memory things that have been deposited. <sighs> That you would allow me to say only what you want me to say, God. You have impressed this word on my heart for a reason. And I'm praying that as it goes forth, that Holy Spirit, that your will will be done, your word will be done. That somebody in here would hear what was in it for them, God. So move Felix out of the way completely and speak in this place. We don't want to ignore you but we want to speak what you would have said. So we want to hear your voice, God. We want to hear your voice. We want to hear your voice. Open our hearts to hear. Do me a favor. In your own way where you're sitting, just say, God, open my heart to hear. Just in your own way. Let him make your heart ready as you stand here because he made a way. He's the God that moved mountains. He's the God, God that made everything possible. So speak, Holy Spirit, as we give way to your word. In your name we pray and thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Now, Anna, just grace me that God would just move and have his way in our midst. Amen. Um, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, stretch forth your hand. Yeah, tell your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, stretch forth your hand. Amen, amen, amen. As we go to the Word of God, I'm going to read this passage in uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. But I just want to move and let God move and have his way in our midst. I don't know if you realize this in Christianity and in church world, but, but legalism will cause you to miss the move of God in your life. Can I say that? Can, can, I, can, I, can I say y'all? Yeah? That, that sometimes we can become so legalistic. Um, there I add the word ritualistic. There, there I add the word so traditional that when the abnormal happens, we don't allow the abnormal to happen because of either our legalism, our traditionalism, or it's not supposed to go that way. Can I say that? And, and sometimes we can't encounter God or walk with God or move with God because we're not open to what God wants, not open to God doing what God wants done, how he wants to do it. And I think more times than often we forget the truth that he is Lord over everything, right? Um, I understand the fact that the Sabbath was made for man and man for the Sabbath. But some of us sometimes can be so ritualistic when it comes to Sabbath that we forget that God is God over that. Come on, does that make sense? Yeah, so today, I, I don't know, the Lord has me in this place where he just wants me to talk about that briefly to, to break some things so we can open some doors so that God could move and have his way in our midst. I will never forget when I was a young preacher starting out at my first church. I did, uh, it was a Baptist church, and I did the unthinkable. Um, here I was as this young guy at my very first church, and I was teaching Bible study on a Wednesday night. And, um, you know, in the Baptist church, they have the communion table out front. Y'all know that? And they have all the elements on the table, and then it's covered with this white cloth um, to cover all the holy stuff underneath. Well, I was teaching, and in the teaching, I just got comfortable teaching, and I messed around and sat down on that table. Yeah, see how y'all reacted? Yeah, 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 yeah. I tell you, they had a church business meeting. <laughs> I almost lost my first church over the communion <laughs> Boy, what you doing? Nobody heard another word I said for the rest of the day because they thought for sure I was going to burn and go to hell, you know, <laughs> right there on the spot. I'm telling you. Uh, but but, but here's, here, here was this young guy that God was doing some interesting thing through. And uh, Katani and I were leading this ministry, trying to move it in a different direction. And I understand church polity. I understand procedure. I understand all that stuff in the church. But this church was so stuck in yesterday that it was difficult to move. Come on, y'all get what I'm saying? It was difficult to move. It was difficult to transition. It was difficult to get to where God would have us to go. And the text that we have in front of us today 
kind of speaks a little bit about that in a sense, in that we have the story where the scribes, um, and may I add Pharisees, were so stuck in the way things were done yesterday that they had no grace, they had no room to encounter God. Here's how Scripture says it in John, right? He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. And here's the reason his own did not receive him, because they had a perception on how things ought to go. They had a perception on what the cultural norms were, and they didn't see God shifting. They didn't see God changing. They didn't see God doing things completely different. And because they couldn't see God in the now, they missed the move of God. So Scriptures extended the invitation to then to everyone, for it says... As many as receive him, to them he, being God, gave power to become sons and daughters of God. So I thank God for the extended invitation. Are you with me? Does anybody in here thank God for the extended invitation? So we're going to look. Amen. 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 So when we look at the book of Mark, um, to get to my text this morning, when we look at the book of Mark, the book of Mark opens up with Jesus being released in the earth to conduct his earthly ministry. And as he's being released to conduct his earthly ministry, we find him, um, Mark, the, he, he comes from a very interesting historical perspective in that he just outlines the details of what Jesus did just with grave details because he don't want us to miss what God is doing. So we see in chapter 1, he's going around, Jesus is going around healing the sick, right? He calls his disciple, he's healing the sick. He goes around, he heals many. Then he does this interesting thing when you read on chapter 1, between chapter 1 and chapter 2 to get to our text today. His disciples are going out in the grain field, and then, well, let me back up a little bit. Before that, he goes into the, the temple, into the Sabbath, on the Sabbath for worship. There's a man there that has leprosy. He messes around and heals this person um, on the Sabbath day. Come on, say on the Sabbath. Say it again, say on the Sabbath. He heals this guy, and then he messes around the same Sabbath. They're going for a stroll out in the cornfield, and his disciples get hungry, and they're picking some grain and eating, and the scribes and Pharisees are like this. Ooh, they're going to hell. They just like Pastor Gilbert. They sat on that communion table, right? <laughs> and they're accusing them of all this stuff, and then Jesus makes this interesting statement about the fact that the Sabbath was not made for man, but man for the Sabbath, and then he makes makes this declaration. Check this out. He says, he himself now is Lord of the Sabbath. If, if you're a Pharisee and you're sitting there and you hear this statement and you have to figure for hundreds if not thousands of years, you've been committed to upholding the Sabbath and this guy going to come on the scene and he's going to say he's over all that so he can do whatever he wants whenever he wants to do it because he's God. Then he adds, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. He's asking to be killed. He's asking to be killed. And this now is Jesus' tension with these scribes and Pharisees as we approach the text today. So when you look at the text, now that he just said he's Lord of the Sabbath, he finds himself on another Sabbath day entering the temple, and he's about to do something crazy once again. So look at the text with me. Let's read this, and then we're going to walk through it to allow God to be God. So verse 1 of chapter 3. Let me read the entire thing, then we're going to back into it and talk about it. It says, again now he entered the synagogue. And then I'm reading from the ESV, and a man was there with a withered hand. Come on, say he had a withered hand. And I love verse 2 because it says, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful to heal on, uh, on, on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger and grieved at their hardness of heart. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And verse 6 is troubling. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him to keep him. Now, this, 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 as we look at this parable, most of us can easily make the mistake to think the text is about the man with the withered hand. But don't make the mistake. The man with the withered hand is just a simple byproduct of the text that's in front of him. When you look at this, the man himself is silent, right? He plays no role in the particular passage. It's not that he has to exemplify any faith 
Um, he is just positioned. He just happened to be positioned in the right place as the story unfolds. And then he ends up being the benefactor of what God wants done to him because he was positioned in the right place. And then what's interesting about the text that you're going to see in a little while is that his very adversary himself, even though they won't say it publicly, they knew who he was and they knew what he could do because listen to the details. They watched him to see if he would heal the man. So they knew he had the ability. Come on, say Jesus has the ability. Yeah, very, very important that we not miss that. But, but, but the thing that's striking about the text is just how serious and how legal these scribes and Pharisees had become as it relates to the observance of the Sabbath day such that they could not do ministry for it hindering them. When I look at this text, look with me at verse 1 and 2. Let's talk through that, and then we're going to move and let God have his way. It says, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand, and they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Now, if I am new to Christianity, and I'm reading this text on the surface, I might be misconceived into believing, Pastor Steve, that when I come to church, I shouldn't raise my hand and worship God because I might get in trouble because somebody's watching. I wish I had somebody here. If I'm reading this text on the surface, it's easy for me to assume that you don't perform healings on Sunday because somebody is watching and they might get offended. But at this, on the surface, on the surface, I know better, but, but if I'm reading this text... On the surface, it, it may seem, and I just see how the Pharisees were treating Jesus, it would be easy for me to assume that you don't do altar calls on Sunday. You don't allow God to move. You don't allow the miraculous to happen in church because on the Sabbath, it was not allowed on the Sabbath day. And, and the sad commentary is a lot of us in our Christian journey are so used to God not doing the supernatural on the Sabbath that we've developed a Pharisaic mindset. Now, let me help you with the Pharisaic mindset. Here's what the Pharisees thought. Matter of fact, you understood that the Lord had called them for a specific purpose. He had given them the law. He had given them the Torah. He had given the Deuteronomical law. He had given them all of that. And one of the, 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 one of the predominant law that he allowed them to, to have was this whole issue of keeping the Sabbath. The problem with the Pharisees and the problem with the Jews is they took the concept of the Sabbath overboard and nothing was allowed to be done. Where it says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. They had schools of thought that translated to that to minute detail such that absolutely no work was allowed on the Sabbath day. If you wanted to eat, you had better cook. Here's a word I'm going to use on the day of preparation or the day before the Sabbath because you are not allowed to cook on a Sabbath. The only things that were allowed on Sabbath and with condition was if a woman was pregnant and she ended up being in delivery, doctors were allowed to deliver the baby. Here's the extent of this. If you cut your hand, you were only allowed to bind the womb. You were not allowed to put ointment because that would be considered work. Here's the extent of this law. If you found yourself on the outside and, and a building fell, I'm, I'm giving you some exaggerated examples of how they went to the law. You were only allowed to clear enough rubble from the person's face so they can continue to breed until after the Sabbath. Delivering them would be considered work. Yeah, yeah, I want you all to hear the extent. The extent of the Sabbath. And, and so now Jesus comes on the scene, right? And, and Jesus starts to do this work. He starts to define who he is. And, and he's violating traditions. He's violating laws. He's going against everything that was tradition, everything that was legal, everything that had a bunch of rules and regulations. And the Sabbath or legalistic people did not know what to do with him. <laughs> And I'm venturing to say, as we talk about how God moves today, we got to be open. Now, look at, look at this, what it says here. It says here, verse 3, uh, and uh, let me back up a little bit. He says, again, he entered the synagogue, and a man with a withered hand was there, and they watched to see whether they would heal the man on the Sabbath that they might accuse him. Come on, say they watched. 
Say it again. Say they watch. Here's what that word watch, it's in the imperfect tense, and here's what the imperfect kind of connotes. Ongoing action. Ongoing action. So here's what that means. Here's what that means. Wherever Jesus went, whatever Jesus did, these people were peeping him out like the young people would say. They wanted to see what he was doing. Man, you're breaking the law. You shouldn't be doing this. You shouldn't be doing that. They're watching him, right? And, and, and let me just throw this. I'm going to talk through this because I'm very, very cautious with legalism creeping in the church because a lot of us don't want to be involved in what God has called us to do because we're concerned because we hadn't done it that way before. We're not used to that. You kind of get what I'm saying? Or, or we have a mindset on how we think things ought to happen, and because it doesn't go the way we think it ought to go, we don't get involved in it. So here it says here, and verse 3, so as they were watching him that they may accuse him, he said to the man that was there with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, now he's confronting his watchers, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm? To save a life or to kill. And I love the response. And they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved by the what? Hardness of their heart. Let me jump down to verse 6 and then we're going to back into this a little bit. When he had done what he needed to do, it says the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel now with the Herodians against him to destroy him. Back up to verse 3. He said to the man with the withered hand, come here, I'll talk about that in a little while. And he said to them, he's speaking to the crowd now, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or, or to kill and it says, and they were silent, and then Jesus got ticked off. And he was grieved, he says, at the what? Hardness of their heart. Come on, say hardness of their heart. Hardness. One more time, say God, hardness of heart. Hardness. Now, here's what I want you to take away just from this little thing. And hear me say this, because I want you all to understand this as we move into this next season of ministry, right? God's redemptive work knows no constraints. I want you to get that in your spirit. Here's what Jesus is confronting these scribes and Pharisees were. They had a set of rules and regulations that says that if a person is sick, you can't do this for them on the Sabbath. If, if this is happening, you can't do this on the Sabbath. If this is happening, you can't do this on the Sabbath. It was a bunch of rules and regulation of do's and don'ts that says you can't do this, that you can't do that, you can't do it. And here's Jesus' question now because he says the Son of Man has come to seek and love the save which was lost. And so he's looking at this crowd. He said, help me understand this. I know what the law says, but is it lawful to do good or to do evil, to save or to kill on the Sabbath? Now, they knew what the right answer was, just like you know what the right answer is, right? Now, I want you all to flesh this out with me. You know what the right answer is, but the principle is this. Because the people were so stuck on what the law says, they pretended they did not know what the response was at the risk of in, um, incriminating themselves, and they kept silent. And what Jesus was trying to communicate, I, I, got it, I, I want you to hear, what he was really trying to communicate is, listen, I know what the law says. I know what the rules are. I know what the regulation is. But if you understand who I am, I wish I had somebody. If you understand what I've come to do, and if you understand the truth, like we said, if you look at chapter 2, when his disciples were eating the grain of the field, I am the Lord of the Sabbath. There are certain exceptions to the rule. Does anybody in here know that when God shows up on your program, his intent is to violate the rules of your program because we can't, I wish I had somebody in here, we can't dictate to God when he ought to move, how he ought to move, what he ought to do, and when he ought to do it. God will do what he wants to do when he wants to do it because he's God all by himself. Do I have anybody? in here that understands that. And my problem with the church today, just like Jesus had a problem with the Pharisees of his day, is that sometimes we miss the move of God because of our mindset from yesterday. Church ought to look this way. Church ought to function this way. 
Church have these sets of rules and these sets of regulation and these sets of things. And here's what we can do. Here's what happens in a lot of our lives. We become legalistic not knowing it. We get trapped in legalism not knowing it. You kind of get what I'm saying? Because our cultural norm defines how we ought to function. But I love the fact that God's redemption violates any culture. God will do, excuse the grammar, whatsoever he needs to do, whensoever he needs to do it to accomplish his purpose in the earth realm. And here's what we have. Here's what we have. You'll, you'll appreciate this. We have a lot of church operating in a CD era when we are in a cloud age. <laughs> if I was preaching this 10 years ago, I said eight tracks and cassettes. You kind of get what I'm saying? Some of y'all still buying CDs. You can download stuff now. Cars don't even come with CDs, players no, yeah. You're getting it, right? So I, I'm making a point, I'm making a point, because if we don't shift our minds from how it was yesterday, from how things function yesterday, you will miss the move of God today. Here's what I appreciate about worship this morning, right? Most of you come expecting three songs and a poem. That's what I love about worship today, right? And you come expecting, all right, they got one more song to go. They come on, talk to me, y'all. And, and if it doesn't fit in your norm, you say, what's off? What's wrong? What? Ain't nothing off. Ain't nothing wrong. Ain't nothing missing. God can do what God wants to do, how he wants to do it. We must get to the place where we are sensitive and open to the move of God, how he wants to do it. And until we get there, until we get there, we'll be stuck in yesterday. This was the problem in the text. This is the argument with the text. Jesus is saying, shouldn't I do good? I know what the law says. I know what the timing is. I know what the detail is. But there's a need. Shouldn't I address the need? And here's what that means so, so I can help connect the dot. Sometimes it means responding to the voice of God when God speaks in spite of what's going on. <sighs> and man, that's difficult for a lot of us in our lives, right? Let me help you with this because you might be in a situation at work and God is speaking. And here's what you say, shut up, God, I'm at work. <laughs> Legalism and you don't even know it. God gives your word to your spouse, and, and you just had an argument, and you can't say it because the situation say, wait till it cools down to say what God says. Legalism at home, and you don't even realize it. Are you hearing me? You see how this works? Don't think it's only in the synagogue. Come on. It transfers in our life. It transfers on the playground. It transfers wherever we find ourselves. Jesus shows up to do something unique, and we don't allow him to do it because of who we are, and it's not supposed to happen now. It's not supposed to happen then, and we don't make room for God to move. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better stop the legalism. Come on, turn to the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor. You ought to stop the legalism. So repeat after me. Say self. God's redemptive work knows no constraints. It doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter where you find yourself. When God shows up and God says he wants this done, we ought to make room for God to do it. And I'm finding that even more and more in the next season of this ministry as we continue to move with God. God is going to speak. God's going to say some things. God's going to, let me add this, send some people. And here's what we can't do. We didn't do it that way before. What are we doing? Are you hearing me? Watch out for legalism. One more time, say, watch out for legalism. Say it again, say, watch out for legalism. So now, this man happens to be an example that Jesus now decides to use 
to show what can happen when we make room for the Holy Spirit to have his way in the midst of any circumstance, in the midst of any situation, in the midst of wherever we found, find ourselves. As I said to you, I want to be very, very clear. The focus of the text is not the man himself. The focus is the principle of legalism and the Sabbath abiding Jews that Jesus wanted to do the miraculous, but they keep missing him. So here, all of a sudden, this man finds himself, I'm going to use the word, in the right place and the right time. And and then Jesus uses him now as an example to amplify what he once said. So notice what Jesus says. So, come on, say, let's talk about the man. Come on, say, let's talk about the man. Look at verse 3. And so, and he said, well, let me back up to verse 1. And again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. So Jesus now responds to this legalistic situation. Here's what he did. He said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said, he went what he did with them. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save or to kill? But they were silent, okay? And he looked around with them in anger, grieve at the hardness of the heart. I love this, right? And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. Come on, say stretch it out. One, one, more, one more time, say stretch it out. Now, Three observations I want to make about this man that I want to give you an application that's relevant to yourself and to myself so we can walk through this. Number one, I want you to understand with me about the infirmity that this man had, okay? Notice what the text says. As he entered the synagogue, a man was there with a withered hand. Now, I don't understand all of what your translation may say, but my translation does not say the withered situation was from birth. So here's, here's when, you do, when you do the lexical work on that word withered, right? Here's what it means. The word withered in, in the Greek language, it speaks to the fact that something existed and then something happened that caused the thing to wither or to dry away. Now, when that word is used, it's normally used in the framework of a tree with its leaves withering. You kind of get that. Or a plant that withered because of the storm. Come on, talk to me, right? Or, or something that happened that caused something that once had life for the life to be sucked out of the thing. Oh, you got to get this. This is, this is very, very important information. Because here's what you observe with me, number one, that the man's infirmity was not necessarily something, though it could have been, but it was not necessarily something that he was born with or that happened to him from birth. So here's what some commentators say. Something probably happened to the man that caused his hand to end up being withered. Are you with me? Now, now, I need to point that out because the Pharisees themselves, because they were so caught up in legalism, they didn't realize that their legalistic Pharisaic mindset has caused their journey with God to itself be withered. <laughs> Been in church so long, singing the same songs for so long. Come on, saying the same prayer for so long. I used to be Baptist, and I can tell you how a Baptist deacon would pray. This morning, our Heavenly Father, once again, we come into your presence with bowed high, humble eyes, and hope knees. Oh, come on, you all know the prayer. You all know the prayer. His spirituality has withered. He wasn't always that way, but something happened that drew the life out of him, and you can't get him to see nothing new because tradition has stepped in, and my concern is for you and it's for me that we get withered. We weren't always like that. But something happened that dries you up. And where you once had life, life is not there no more. Come on. Withered. Oh, somebody talk to me. I'm venturing it. Some of y'all in here used to shout for Jesus. You used to sing for Jesus. You used to preach for Jesus. You used to pray for Jesus. But something happened that has withered your hand. Come on, do I have any witnesses here? And may I say legalism. May I say a mindset. May I say something. Like the Pharisees. Are you with me? He wasn't born that way. Number one, he wasn't born that way. 
Number two, watch the text. He entered the synagogue. You kind of get what I'm saying? This is what I love about this fella. And the man was with was with her hand was there. Here, here's the thing that I love about the text. He was positioned in the right place to receive a word from the Lord. His infirmity did not keep him away. Here's what happened to me. When withering steps in, I stop coming. I'm almost done. I disengage. You kind of get where I'm going? And, and, and what, here's what happens when we disengage. We dry up even more. Such that we can't even feel the presence of God. Because withering implies or connotes a drying up. What I love about this fella is that he was positioned in the right place. I've got good news for you this morning. You're positioned in the right place. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, yeah. Come on, y'all. Yeah. You kind of get what I'm saying? Tell your neighbor, say, neighbor, you're in the right place. One more time, say, neighbor, you're in the right place. Okay. Now, here's the third thing. Here's the third thing. I'm almost done. I'm almost done, right? The man then, here's what he did. He seized the moment, watch this, and then he defied tradition to get his healing from Jesus. One more time. He seized the moment, then he defied tradition to get his healing from Jesus. One more time, one more time, one more time. He seized the moment, and he defied tradition to get his healing from Jesus. But what are you talking about, preacher? Here's what Jesus did, right? Look at the text. Look at the text carefully. Verse 3. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. I think if you have an NIV, the NIV probably says stand up or something like that. Is that what the NIV said? If you have an NIV, come on, y'all talk to me, NIV people. It says what? It says stand up. Here's what you need to know about that Greek phrase, come here. The, the, I, I, I don't like the NIV's transition because if you understand historically and culturally, when you went to synagogue, the seats weren't these nice, comfortable seats that you're sitting in, and the rows weren't these nicely separated rows that you're sitting in, and the preacher weren't always up in front, in front of the congregation with microphones looking out. What would happen in the synagogue, it was circular seating. And they would be on either rocks or on the floor in a circle sitting around. So the man was on the periphery. I wish I had somebody here. He was on the outside sitting on his stone in a circle. And when Jesus said, come here, understand that at the moment he was teaching in the synagogue. So guess where Jesus was not? He was not on the periphery. So he was in the center of the circle talking and speaking. So here's what the Greek language says, when he said, come here, he's saying, stand up and position yourself, I wish I had somebody, in the middle where everyone can see. Because here's what God, when God does the miraculous, he's not the secret kind of God. He wants the whole world to see what he's doing because he wants everyone to celebrate. And look at the text, look at the text. And then he said to the man, verse 5b, Stretch out your hand. Now, y'all got to see this. This fella is sitting here, and he's got the withered hand. And Jesus says, come, so he mustered up the courage to come with a withered hand. And Jesus says, stretch it out. Here's what he could have said. Hey, G, you realize I'm a Jew. And you do realize that the Sabbath says... No healing on a Sabbath. So I heard what you said, but guess what I'm not going to do? Because I got to go live with them Pharisees. And he could have walked away. Thank you. My fear is some of y'all came with a withered hand. Come on, y'all. And you're positioned in the right place. And God is about to release a word of healing over your life. But here's what you say. You know who I'm sitting with. 
I've been fooling them all these years into thinking I'm saved. I've been fooling them all these years into thinking I'm this. They don't need to know I have no problem. I'm not getting up in the middle of nothing for nobody to see me. I'm going to continue to sit on the periphery. Don't extend to me that invitation. But here's what the fellow did. He violated the traditional and the cultural norms. He violated everything around him because he wanted his healing from Jesus. And it mattered not to him what anybody said. And watch the text. The text says, then he stretched out his hand. And as he stretched out his hand, it was what? Restored. Come on. I know somebody's in here. Somebody in here is saying to me, that preacher, you know, my hand ain't withered. Well, don't make the mistake that I'm talking about a literal withered hand. A withered hand situation could be that marriage that you'll find yourself in. Your withered hand could be the thing that has you in stronghold. The withered hand could be the fact that you can't find a job and God's been trying to bless you. Your withered hand could be a condition or something that you're going through, some ailment. Lock into the withered hand. You weren't born with it, but something happened. Circumstances, crisis, some calamity happened that it has you in this place where you're not plugged in no more. You're not involved no more. You're not engaged no more. Come on. You won't let nobody get in your space because of your withered hand. Jesus has stopped by this morning to say, stretch forth your hand. And as you stretch it out, watch what God is going to do. Stretch it out. Trust him. Trust him. I'm done, but let me say this. Stretching it out is going to require you going against everything you feel. Everything you sense. Everything you know. And lock into this. If that thing is preventing you from obeying God, you have positioned yourself in the camp of the Pharisees and legalism is preventing you from obeying God. You see how this works? And y'all thought it was just church stuff. Are you hearing me? If you walk out of here today like this, don't blame nobody but yourself. Are you hearing me? Come on, worship team. Don't blame nobody but yourself. I say it again. Don't blame nobody but yourself. Bow your heads with me. My prayer this morning is that there would be such a freedom in this church there would be such a flow of the miraculous in the church. There would be such a mighty move of God in this church. There would be such a presence of God in this church. Now we won't wait for worship to begin. Come on. We won't wait for the word to go forth. We'll come in here with expectation because we're willing to violate traditional norms to allow God to be God. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. You got to hear me say that. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It doesn't matter what past situation, what past circumstances that. Those things have caused our hands to be withered. And there comes a point in time where we violate it by stretching forth our hand. God did not create you for the withered situation we find ourselves in. Allow him to move. Allow him to move. There's gifts, there's callings, there's destiny, there's greatness sitting out here. And the world is waiting for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. Let God have his way. Come on, stand to your feet this morning. Stand to your feet. If God is speaking to you this morning, you just want to come to this altar just to pray. If you want to connect with one of these ministers, we want to invite you to come to let God be God. Let God be God. If you haven't given your life to God, we want to give you a chance to come. Come this morning. If you have a withered situation, some debilitating condition that keeps you from responding to God, 
Let God move this morning. Let God move this morning. Come on, come, 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 come. I know God is talking. Come this morning. Come. Don't worry about who's sitting next to you. Don't worry about who's looking at you. Come this morning. Come. Come. It's all taught to be filled with people that are hearing God talk and saying, God, I'm going to respond regardless of wherever I find myself. Whatever yesterday was, don't let that prevent you from going into your morning tomorrow. You're legalizing yourself. Trust God like that. Trust God like that. Holy Spirit, move in this place, God. Move in this place. We give today to you. That you get the glory. You get the praise. You be honored. You be glorified in everything that transpires here, God. Draw people. Draw them, God. Draw them, draw them, draw them to you. Thank you so much for who you are and what you're doing. Draw people, Lord, as we give this to you. Move in this place. Continue to move in this place, God. Heal perform the miraculous God this ministry is not going to be the same these people are not going to be the same because we're going to be open to your voice we're going to be open to who you are continue to move God as we give this to you